Our next guest is extraordinarily welcome in this country and to this Eucharistic Convention. Astronaut Michael Hopkins spoke to us yesterday, and if you have a look on your program on page nine, it says, um, bringing the cosmos to the schools. Well, I know that um, Michael went to Westlake Girls College uh, on Friday uh, and was very bravely encountered about 450 young women uh, in the auditorium there and survived by all accounts. Um, he left intact, uh, no small achievement these days, uh, and, uh, uh, and I know that he's kind of hit the ground running since he's been in New Zealand. I understand that yesterday Michael was visiting the Little Sisters of the Poor in, uh, in Hearn Bay, and no doubt uh, many of our priests who are retired and living there uh, and uh, would be delighted to see him, uh, and I know that he'd have been made most welcome, and he's been doing other things quietly about which he doesn't speak, but he's literally hit the ground running since he's come to New Zealand, and we are very grateful that he's here. Uh, anyway, yesterday, Michael spoke about uh, his time in space, which I, I really can't get my head around at all, 163, 166 days circling the Earth, uh, doing the kind of things that these very special people do. And I asked him just a few moments ago, what time of the day does your day start? He said about five o'clock. And they work right through until seven o'clock at night and checking in with HQ in various parts of the world. Well, it's, it's a very demanding and extraordinary schedule, but you know, I was unable to give him any advice, which I found very strange, but uh, he didn't seem to need that. Uh, so we just kind of moved on. But so yesterday he, he spoke about things professional. I think that's how I uh, discern it to be. Today he talks about things private. And those things are specifically Catholic. And he's one of those very, very few privileged lay people who was allowed to give himself Holy Communion. It's a private conversation with astronaut Mike Hopkins. Good morning. Uh, before, I, before I get started on, on talking about the opportunity to take the Eucharist up to space, I want to uh, just briefly talk about on Friday night, uh, John had mentioned how long it had taken the process to uh, allow me to, NASA, to permit me to come and, and visit with you today. And it was like a nine month process. And we also heard about how NASA gets thousands and thousands of requests for. Uh, what we call PRs, public relation outreach uh, for the, the astronauts. Uh, NASA's, one of their primary objectives is to explore space and to explore Earth. And, and so as such, when we go out on PRs, that is our primary objective, is to share that story. And so when these requests come in, uh, they go through a, a lengthy review process uh, for these PRs because they want to make sure that there's going to be that opportunity. Uh, NASA does not uh, promote any individual private firm. Uh, they don't promote any religion. And, and so there's always a legal review. And uh, I actually, uh, uh, quite frankly, I was a little surprised when they agreed to allow me to come and, and speak at the uh, Eucharistic Convention here in New Zealand. And uh, so God, uh, <laughs> he works. He does work wonders. Um, and so I want to thank John. I don't know if John is in here uh, for pushing the envelope. John, I want to thank you for pushing the envelope and, uh, and having, uh, having me come here because, uh, quite frankly, uh, my time here, I have, uh, I have been humbled and I have been inspired by, by uh, all of the other speakers here. I've got to tell you, it's interesting for me to come to New Zealand and have a chance to meet Sister Joseph and Mother Assumpta who live and work just a few miles down the road for my son who is going to university at University of Michigan. Uh, so I'm very excited about uh, the opportunity. I know it's crazy, right, to, to come here to meet them. I'm very excited about the opportunity next time I go visit my son to, to get to go meet them as, as well. So I think that's fantastic. Uh, the other speakers as well, uh, my gosh, Aurora, Asia. I, I'm, uh, 
Asia helped bring me back down to earth, I got to say. So, so John, thank you again very much for, for having me here. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience so far. I also want to mention uh, the trip yesterday to the Little Sisters of the Poor. I went there yesterday afternoon and I had a chance to speak to some of the residents there, some of the residents there. And again, just a, an amazing, amazing experience. Uh, I was sitting there next to uh, a lady um, who was talking to me about her uh, kids, her grandkids, her great-grandkids, and her great-great-grandkids. <laughs> and But this is the part of the story that I thought was, was amazing. She said, I'm not Catholic. And she said, yet they, the Little Sisters of the Poor opened their home to me and brought me in. And she was very thankful for that. And so I think that just shows you how wonderful the, the Catholic faith, the Catholic religion is when you reach out to anybody uh, that's out there, that's in need. And so that was, that was very uh, special for me. And, and so the Little Sisters of the Poor, I think I did see uh, Sister Alba here as well. Yes, thank you very much for, for yesterday. It was uh, wonderful to get to share some time with you. Okay. Um, I don't know if you've ever had a time in your life when you felt like something was missing. In 2012, I, I had that time in my life, and it's, it's kind of interesting because at that point in my life, I had a lot of very, very, very good things going for me. And we can go to the next slide. I'll start with my family. Um, this is, uh, I think you can see it on both sides there. This is my family, my wife Julie, and my two sons, uh, Ryan and Lucas. And uh, I love my family dearly, and they are absolutely amazing. And, and so we have a very strong uh, family relationship, which is, uh, which is very, very important to me. Um, at the same time, let's go to the next slide. In 2009, after four tries over 13 years, I got selected to be an astronaut. And I got to join 13 other amazing people and we started this uh, two-year training process. If you can go to the next slide, just a picture of some of that training. This is actually in the, uh, what's called the Vomit Comet. So it's this airplane that you, goes up real high and then it dives down towards the Earth. And during that dive towards the Earth, you get about 15 seconds or so of simulated microgravity. And so that's uh, our class in this airplane as we're uh, practicing microgravity. So. I've got a wonderful family, I've been selected as an astronaut, some incredible training, and then uh, in 2011, we can go to the next slide, I was selected to actually go to space. I was uh, selected to be a part of expeditions, what we call expeditions 37 and 38, and you can see the picture there with uh, my two crewmates that I launched, the two Russian crewmates I launched with, Oleg and Sergei, and uh, some of the amazing training that uh, was going on that I was getting to do to prepare to go to space. But, like I said, despite all of these amazing things in my life, I felt like something was missing. Now, going back a little bit, uh, I grew up as a non-practicing Methodist. I met my wife, Julie, at the University of Illinois, and, uh, and we got married. She's a, she grew up Catholic, and so uh, we got married, and as part of that, we went through the Catholic classes and uh, I had to agree to, if we had children, to have them baptized Catholic and uh, raise them in the Catholic Church. But I was determined that I was not going to become Catholic. I had told Julie that uh, what I thought was important was your relationship with God. And, and so I wanted to be that example for my sons that, uh, that that's what was important, not necessarily whether you were Catholic or Methodist or Presbyterian. I see you, Chris. Um, but that's, uh, you know, that, that that's what I wanted to show my kids. I wanted to be that example for them. Um, but then all of a sudden, when all of these amazing things are happening to me, and I felt this emptiness, and I realized that was my relationship with Jesus. And... So I went, to, uh, I went to Julie and said, hey, I want to become Catholic. About knocked her out of her seat because she's heard me for, for 20 years. I had been going to the Catholic Church with her. I'd been you know, sitting through Mass, and except when they would get up to receive communion, I would stay in the pew. 
And that about knocked her uh, off of her seat. Uh, but uh, the next thing, um, which is amazing, I think God has a way to put people in your lives when you have a need. And so if we can go to the next slide, uh, this is one of those individuals. This is uh, Father Skip Nagley, who was the priest at our parish. And uh, we went, so at this time, too, I was going through all of this training. And so I would be gone for four, five, six weeks at a time. And then I would come home for a couple weeks, and I'd be gone again back to Russia, back to Japan, to Europe. And so constantly traveling, which made it very difficult uh, for me to go through the normal RCIA classes. And Father Skip said, Mike, not a problem. He said, whenever you're home, we will get together and we will get through as many of the classes as we can and, uh, and we'll get you through this process. And so if it hadn't been for Father Skip, uh, I wouldn't be able to stand here today and talk to you about taking the Eucharist into space. Now, I'll also mention one thing that was kind of interesting. Uh, when we had our first meeting, Julie and I went and met with Scott, Father Skip and he said, Mike, why do you want to be Catholic? And I said, well, I want to be able to fully participate in my family's religious life. And he looks at me and he says, Mike, that's not a reason to become Catholic. <laughs> and so there was this wonderful journey for me in these meetings where I, I got to uh, really search why, why I wanted to become Catholic. And at the end of the day, it was realizing that I wanted to be able to experience uh, my relationship with Jesus through the Eucharist. And, and so in December of 2012, I was uh, confirmed in the Catholic Church. So, yeah, thank you. Um, so now I should be happy, right? I should be satisfied. I've, I've got a wonderful family. I've become an astronaut. I'm going to space, and I can now receive uh, the Blessed Sacrament. But I wasn't. <laughs> because now I knew I was going to be gone for seven months. Um, it takes about a month of right before you launch into space where you're going through your last minute training and qual exams and things of that nature. And then you're gone for six months up into space. Well, I did not want to give up the, uh, the opportunity to receive, uh, receive the Eucharist, receive communion. And so, again, God uh, works in great ways and brings people into your life. At this point, Father Skip, uh, he's a lost Salette missionary, and so he had to, to uh, go to another, another job. And if we go to the next slide... Uh, Father Jim uh, came in to our parish, and, and so I talked to Father Jim, and I talked to uh, Deacon Chuck there with his wife Beth, and I asked, I said, I'd like to be able to take the Eucharist into space, and they kind of looked at me, and said, okay, um, and so they went to the Archdiocese of Galveston, and this is one of those things that's, that's quite interesting for me. Uh, God has a way of opening up doors, and, and I have no idea what they had to do. I have no idea... The conversations they had, I, I, I really don't know. I just know at, at one point they came back and said, uh, the Archdiocese has agreed, and you're going to be able to take the Eucharist up into space. And uh, so, now what? How do we go about doing that? <laughs> That's, uh, so, so now I worked a lot with uh, Deacon Chuck there, and if you go to the next slide, um, quite frankly at this point, because I'm a, I'm a baby Catholic, um, I, I'm really... Uh, have a long way to go on my journey. And so at this point, I didn't even know what a PIX was. <laughs> and so uh, Deacon Chuck says, well, Mike, you got to get a PIX. And, uh, and then the other thing is just understanding the, the rites and the instructions of, of receiving the Holy Communion. And so uh, they gave me the, the uh, communion of the sick, the little pamphlet there. That, uh, and so those two items, in fact, I've got them right here, uh, I was able to take into space with me. And, but... So before, before we do that, uh, how are we going to uh, prepare the, the, I'll say the wafers to be consecrated and all of that? Because my picks, it has to be small, um, only held six wafers. And so what we did, uh, and this was Ch uh, uh, Deacon Chuck, he actually took the wafers and we divided them into four. And we did this before they were consecrated. You're probably saying, well, why is that important? Well, it's important because if we, if when I was in space, I had a whole wafer and I wanted to try and just take a piece of it as opposed to, you know, so that I could spread out uh, my ability to receive the, the uh, communion. The problem is, uh, if, you know, if you, if you break off a small piece, there's a very good chance of small pieces also breaking off. And in space, what happens is they float away. 
And, and so that wasn't a very good option uh, to have very small pieces of Jesus floating all around the space station and into the air vents and all of that kind of stuff. So we went through the process of dividing uh, the wafers up and, and making sure there were no little pieces as we put them into the picks. And then on my last, uh, my last mass back in Houston, uh, before, before I left to go into my final training, uh, we consec they consecrated um, the, into, into the Eucharist and, and Jesus. And so I was able to take that with me then at that point, and it was prepared and ready for me to be able to receive uh, 24 uh, different days of, of communion while I was in space. And believe it or not, it just so happens that the length of my mission in space was 24 weeks. So it worked out, worked out absolutely perfectly. Uh, okay, so the, the doors continue to open. When you get ready to launch into space, uh, they, uh, the Russians, so we launch on the Russian uh, vehicle right now, the Russian Soyuz, and you get to take up some individual private things with you. And normally what happens is the Russians, when you show up for your final training trip, they take all of those items because they need to categorize them because uh, everything matters. Every ounce matters that you're taking up in this space vehicle. So they take every item and they weigh them, they categorize them, etc. Well, I couldn't just give them the body of Christ. And, and so the, I talked to the person that normally does this, and I, I explained uh, uh, the significance and, and what this meant to me, and, and he said, no problem. He said, you, you keep it, we'll estimate how much it weighs, we'll estimate, uh, um, and it's, it's not an issue whatsoever. And so again, it's just... It is amazing to me how these doors continued to open that uh, were allowing me to, to take the, uh, the Eucharist up with me into, into space. So, let's go to space. Let's go to the, uh, to the next slide. So this is a video that doesn't look like, is it playing? I hope it plays. Can we uh, go back and uh, see if we can get it to play here? Can you just arrow up and then arrow back down? And that, uh, maybe that'll kick it off and, and get it rolling. Maybe not. Oh, there we go. All right, I see movement. Very good. So where we are right now is uh, we are in, uh, outside of Moscow, we're going through our final qual exams. And so we're going to crawl into a simulator and we're going to spend about the next six hours going through uh, emergency scenarios as we launch and dock and descend that back down to Earth. And so that's getting us ready for this. Uh, this is the actual vehicle down in uh, Baikonur in Kazakhstan. Uh, there we are getting ready to crawl up into that vehicle about two hours before the actual launch. And right now, in my right pocket, in my spacesuit, is Jesus. Um, and so as I am uh, walking up uh, that ladder and, and getting uh, strapped in, uh, and as we're getting down to this countdown, let me tell you, knowing that I literally had Jesus with me as you're sitting on top of 600,000 pounds of rocket fuel that's getting ready to explode. It's a very uh, comforting thing. And so at this point, uh, the rocket lights, and in less than nine minutes, you're up in space. You're up and you're going uh, 17,500 miles an hour. And uh, here's the spacecraft as we're rendezvousing with the International Space Station. And so about six hours later, we're docking to the International Space Station. So it took me uh, less than half the time to get to the International Space Station than it took me to fly here from Houston on, uh, on Friday. So pretty, pretty amazing trip. Uh, one of the first things we do when we get inside the International Space Station is we get to have a video conference with our family. Our families were over in Baikonur. There's my wife, Julie. You can see my two sons, Lucas, uh, the ones that's very excited to see Dad in space, as you can if you can tell, uh, it's actually been a long day for them. Uh, they've been up for about uh, 24 hours or so watching the launch and all of that. Uh, so there's the crew when we get on board. And uh, uh, there's, so three, three astronauts were there uh, before we got there and we joined them. So they had been there about three months and, and so we now became a crew of six. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, the advantages of microgravity, they, they let you take some pretty cool pictures. Uh, when you're inside the station. Let's go to the next uh, slide and you can see, uh, hopefully you can get a sense uh, from these pictures. I know the lighting's, the lighting's pretty bad, but uh, that's three of us jammed inside that Soyuz spacecraft. So there's not a lot of extra room inside uh, the spacecraft, but 
uh, it's a very reliable way to get to space, and, uh, and it's not the most comfortable in the world, but it gets you there and it gets you home safe. Uh, so why are we up on the International Space Station? Why do we go there? And the bottom line is it's science. Uh, we, are, we are up there uh, ex going through experiments to try and help us figure out how to explore space and how to improve life down here on Earth. So we can go to the next slide. As astronauts, the way we go about that, uh, there's multiple ways. We are the guinea pigs. And so uh, we are actual subjects, the test subjects, and uh, there's a lot of different experiments. In this case, you saw one where they're taking an ultrasound of my eye. Uh, we also interact with a lot of the physical sciences, and so in this case, if you can see it, I'm actually talking to a scientist, a principal investigator on the ground, and I am his eyes, his hands, uh, his ears, uh, while, while we're executing that experiment. So it's, a, it's fantastic to be able to talk to a scientist like that as you're doing his experiment. In this case, this is uh, what we call a combustion chamber, and in this, I pulled it out of what we call a rack, and I'm, I'm changing out the, uh, the fuel reservoirs and the igniters and things of that nature. And here I'm getting ready to, to put it back in the rack, but keep your eye out, you're going to see my crewmate, uh, Koichi Wakata, is going to go floating by here. Uh, amazing guy, there's Koichi. Hopefully you can see him. <laughs> but again, what's amazing about this is I, I put this combustion chamber back in the rack and, and then close it up, and overnight while we're sleeping, somebody on the ground is actually executing the experiment. And so as astronauts, uh, we're able to do science in space in many different ways, and it's a very powerful way because it allows us, while I was up there for six months, we did over 200 different experiments. And again, it's experiments where we're directly involved, it's experiments where uh, we're talking directly to the, the investigator, and then there's the ones like this where we just set it up and somebody else uh, actually does the execution of it. Um, so that's the primary goal, but then the other thing that has to happen up there is we have to maintain it. And it actually takes a lot of work to maintain the International Space Station. Uh, in fact, uh, sometimes when things break, you have to go outside the space station as well and go on a spacewalk. So in uh, December, I think it was 11th of 2013, we had a major component of the cooling system, our external cooling system, break. Uh, it was this 800-pound pump module that had broken on the outside of the International Space Station. And why this was important was we generate a lot of heat inside the, the space station from the life support equipment to the experiments, things of that nature. And you got to get rid of that heat, and this pump module was critical to that. And so when it failed, we no longer, we had to shut down basically half the station. And so December 11th, the failure happened. December 21st, let's go to the next slide. Uh, myself and uh, my crewmate Rick Mastracchio are going outside the International Space Station. Here's uh, the folks down in Mission Control. And there you can see we're, we're going outside the airlock. And this is going to be pretty hard to see, um, but uh, basically what's happening is we are crawling around uh, the outside of the space station. There you can saw a quick picture of uh, our wives that were actually there in mission control as we were uh, executing this uh, spacewalk on the 21st. And actually the second one was on Christmas Eve. Uh, there's Koichi Wakata again. He's actually operating the robotic arm probably hard to see, but that's uh, right next to us as we're moving around there is this robotic arm. And, uh, and so we needed that because of the, the size of this module that we had to replace. Um, you keep seeing clips of our family, and I want to emphasize just how, how stressful that can be on your spouse and your loved ones when you're, when you're outside on a spacewalk. Um, it's the most dangerous thing besides the launch and the landing that we do when we're in space. And, of course, for astronauts, it's our dream come true, right? This is, this is what we've wanted to do. Uh, but for your spouse that's sitting there watching this happen real time, uh, it can be very, very stressful. In fact, uh, before, we had, uh, uh, before I got to the space station, we had an, two astronauts that were out on a spacewalk, and his wife, uh, one of them, his wife, was there, and his helmet started filling up with water from the cooling system. And so it was a very dangerous situation. Uh, we had to abort the EVA, abort the spacewalk, um, bring him inside, and she's watching all of this happen real time. And, uh, and so I always try and keep that in mind as we're, as we're going through our, our jobs is uh, it's, a, uh, it's a job that sometimes is out there in the public eye, 
and and unfortunately that also means then that your your spouse and your loved time loved ones uh, sometimes get to see things happening real time um, sometimes not not the best of things but anyway uh, an incredible experience to go out um, here you can see a, a picture of me uh, uh, you do have a chance to to take some of those shots and and it is incredible now why am I actually talking about because I'm, I'm here to talk about the Eucharist right Going outside the space station on a spacewalk is, uh, it's like nothing else. It's very stressful. It's, uh, it's this jumble of emotions. And to help me get through that, I received communion both mornings before I went out on my spacewalk. And that was very important for me. It allowed me to, to, uh, to get through uh, that uh, very challenging time. And let's go to the next slide. I suspect this is going to be a little hard to see, uh, but basically you're looking at the robotic arm and at the end of that robotic arm is me. And I'm holding on to that 800 pound pump module. And this was that moment during this spacewalk where I was just, uh, well let's say I was a little scared. Because what happens is that arm is swinging me down below the station and it's bringing me up to where I'm going to now put the, this pump module in. Well, the arm is a little bit flexible. And so when it comes to a stop, there's a tendency for it to, to kind of flex like this. And, and so it moves. I'm holding this 800-pound pump module. And it stops, and it starts to flex. And I thought I was coming off of the arm and floating away in the space with an 800-pound pump module. And so for about two or three seconds there, uh, I was terrified, and so if you roll the tape here again, it doesn't look like uh, it doesn't look like much. Um, but uh, oh, actually, I guess it did, it's not. Go, go. Can you go back down? Let's see if it actually. Yeah, click one more down. Um, from your perspective, if you click one more time. Yeah. So here's that motion. Very. It doesn't look like much oscillation at all. You're probably going, "What is wrong with him?" I thought astronauts supposed to be brave. <laughs> But uh, at that moment, it was actually quite terrifying. So again, the fact that I was able to receive the communion, receive the whole the Blessed Sacrament before I went out the door was very, very, very helpful for me. Um, OK, let's, uh, we also have to live inside the space station. So let's take a look at that. Let's go to the next slide. Um, here's a, a shot inside the space station. And uh, the reason I'm showing this is, is not to show Alex passing along uh, passing the uh, coffee to his crewmate, but actually right here. We'll leave it right here. The um, reason I'm showing this is because what you're looking at is our crew quarter. So that's where, that's our private quarters on board the International Space Station. It's about the size of a, a small uh, broom closet or a, a telephone booth for those of us that are old enough to know what that is. Um, and so that's your private space on board the International Space Station. and. Uh, and so inside, you're able to put up pictures and things of that nature. And that's where I had uh, my pics uh, with uh, the body of Christ was inside, was inside my crew quarters there. And so uh, every Sunday, uh, Beth Turner, who uh, the wife of Deacon Chuck that I was talking about earlier, she would send me up the readings and uh, a short homily. And so then I would, uh, I would in my crew quarters on Sunday mornings, I would use my little uh, communion for the sick. And, and I would have uh, receive, receive communion, receive the Eucharist. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's keep moving. So you remember I talked about, let's go to the next slide. I think, uh, yeah. Remember I talked about if uh, there had been small pieces of the body of Christ and how they could float out. So you here you can kind of get a sense. Uh, Tano's trying to get a, just to get a granola bar. And as soon as you open something up, things want to float all over the place. So you can... You can see it's very challenging, but this is, this is how we, uh, we eat on board the International Space Station. So not only do you need to nourish the soul, but you need to nourish the body. And so here in this case, uh, we're using a dehydrated food packet. You dial in how much water you need, whether you want hot or cold, push the button. It, uh, it fills it up. You let it sit for 10 to 15 minutes, and, and then you use the scissors, get out your spoon, and voila, bon appetit. That's your dinner. Uh, we also have things like irradiated food, kind of like with, from a military standpoint, what we call MREs. And so you can see uh, they're eating some of that here, where all you have to do is heat that, that food up. But again, if you're able to see it, you can, uh, the ability to, 
let go of your spoon or let go of your, your food and all that while you're eating. As, uh, it's pretty nice up there in, in microgravity. Uh, the other thing then, and we'll keep on, keep on rolling as soon as this one's done. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, we exercise. Uh, this is not how we exercise. <laughs> not very effective. What we do is we run on a treadmill. And uh, there you can see I've got a harness on and I use bungees to hold me down uh, on that treadmill. We also have the ability to lift weights. It's not like the weights you see in the gym down here. It's uh, actually a pretty amazing machine. Uh, the other thing, if you can notice there, the whole machine is moving. Uh, we, ha we call it a vibration isolation system because as I'm lifting weights, um, I could actually move the station around if we didn't have that vibration isolation system. Uh, so that's one of the other amazing things about working and living in microgravity. There's the exercise bike. There's no seat, there's no handles, but it's a, uh, it's a heck of a workout. Um, anyway, so we do that uh, 12 hours or two hours a day is, is geared towards exercise. And the reason for that is when you're in microgravity, and no, I do not run this fast, uh, and that's the advantage of the video, but when you're in microgravity, your bones, uh, you can lose up to 2.5% bone density a month. Uh, can we go ahead and stop it right there? I just clicked down, I think. Yeah, that's good, right there. Um, anyway, you can lose about 2.5% bone density in a month. You can um, uh, also your muscles will atrophy. And so the, one of the main ways we counteract that is through the exercise. And so for 100, I was up there 166 days. I exercised every day, uh, 164 of those days. The two spacewalks, I did not, uh, I did not exercise on those days because uh, that's a little, uh, those are long days. Uh, the last, I think the last video that I've got here um, is when you're, when you're on board the space station, NASA does a fantastic job of allowing you to, to stay in touch with your family. And so we actually have what we call an IP phone, so you're able to dial, uh, call, I could call up anybody uh, from the International Space Station. I actually called my wife just about every day, I think, while I was up there. I think I'm pretty sure I called her every day. Uh, Julie was pretty busy during that time. Uh, she had, you know, the boys were involved in five different sports teams. Uh, she worked, she was uh, studying to get her master's in nursing. The boys religious, piano, you name it, she was very busy. They didn't drive yet. There were many, several times when I called down Say, hey, honey, what's up? She said, I don't got time. Call me later. And she'd hang up on me. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the other thing we got to do, and let's uh, go ahead and start the next video, I think, if I've got things. Yeah. Once a week, we got to have a video conference with them. So they actually issued Julie a, a tablet or an iPad that had the conference software on it. And that allowed her to be mobile uh, because the boys were playing hockey. And, and in this case, you're watching her at the hockey rink, and I'm getting to watch them play hockey live from the International Space Station. And uh, boy, you talk about something very special to me, and I hope to, I think to my sons as well, was the fact that they knew, uh, even though I wasn't there, I was there, and in our own special way. So there you can see Julie, she's got the iPad, she's got an earpiece in, so I'm talking to her, and she's following the, the game as it's, as it's taking place, and you can kind of see me in the background there. As, uh, as I'm getting to watch that. She got a lot of strange looks at the hockey rink when uh, people would walk by and they'd see me floating around. Um, but uh, anyway, it was, a, it was a very special, special occasion. Um, I'll, I'll kind of finish my, my talk. You know, I, I've mentioned the Eucharist. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is, this is going to be very hard to, uh, for you guys to, to read, but it's basically a quote from Genesis and uh, the creation of earth and the creation of um, sky and God saying that that, uh, that was good. And when you have an opportunity to see the earth from 400 kilometers, 250 miles up, uh, you realize what he was talking about. And so if you want to go to the next slide, I'll, I'll show you some of the pictures. Uh, so this is the northern lights. And if you, I mean, I wish the, uh, the sun wasn't as bright right now. You guys have amazing weather here, unfortunately. It's making it hard to see this. But anyway, the northern lights, when you get to see them from above and you see the green light as it's dancing across the entire sky from that vantage point is, is just incredible. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, this one's interesting for me. If you can tell what this is, it's a, a typhoon that's over the Pacific. And I got to tell you, one of the interesting things about being in space is you, can some, it, you have to really work to not lose perspective on life down here on Earth. 
And the reason I say that is because this picture, I was so proud of myself, right? I got the, you're seeing the robotic arm in there, and I had it lined up with the eye of the, of the storm, and I'm thinking, man, this is a great picture. And then you have to kind of step back and realize that, well, down on earth, there's millions and millions of people that are in harm's way from this storm. And, and so, uh, incredible views, but sometimes you have to remind yourself that it's, it's not all just a great picture. Uh, let's go to the, the next slide. Uh, this is just uh, the, I think this is over in uh, England or, um, and, and the waters, there was actually a flood that happened and so you can, you know, from space you're able to see just how, how far the, uh, the waters reach inland. Let's go to the next slide. The deserts, and believe it or not, I mean most, uh, most of us probably would not choose to live in the deserts, but when you see the deserts from above and uh, they, they are incredible, incredible pictures. Let's go to the next. This one, again, in the desert, but it looks like a painting to me. The, the clouds over it and, and the different colors are, are amazing. Uh, let's go keep just uh, rolling through here. Yeah, this is called the RECAT structure. It's uh, this circular structure that's very visible from outer space. It's over in uh, north, northwest Africa. Let's uh, go to the next. This is the moon. This is the Caribbean, or the uh, Mediterranean, and the moonlight reflecting off of the, the Mediterranean. Um, and you can see the city lights and all of that. Uh, let's go on to the next, the next picture. Um, you know, there's all this natural beauty that you get to see from, from space. And believe it or not, uh, the man-made things are also just as incredible. And so what you're looking at here is uh, a lot of the um, agriculture that's in the Midwest in, in the U.S. And, and so, again, if you were down there in the field, you might not think... Uh, that it's that amazing, but when you get to see and you see all these crop circles and, and the geometric patterns that, uh, that man has uh, created on the earth, it's, again, it, it kind of takes your breath away. Next slide, um, if you can see this one, I hope. You know, hopefully you can recognize that. That's the uh, boot of Italy. It stands out. You realize why they call it the boot of Italy when you, when you see it from that, uh, that vantage point. You can see Sicily there as well. And then uh, let's go on to the next. I hope you can see this one. Uh, this is, is by far my, my favorite picture from uh, up in, in space. Again, it looks like a painting. And if you go to the next slide, you can see that, that darker blue circle. That's an area of deeper water. And then the, the previous picture was a close-up of the side there. And this is in the Caribbean. And you're basically looking through the water at the sand formations underneath the water from uh, 250 miles up. So go to the next slide again to give you another look at that. Um, uh, man, if uh, this, this for me just reaffirmed that, that there is a God, <laughs> because when you see this, uh, it just it takes your breath away. And so let's go to the next slide. Um, so at this point, that's, that's my story, uh, and I, I want to thank you for letting me share that with you. Um, you know, I, I mentioned yesterday that standing up and talking about my, my faith is something that's very difficult for me because it's very private for me as well. Uh, but I have to say, uh, John, having, having Asia here and hearing her story, uh, what I'm having to do today is not hard at all compared to what, uh, what she's done. So again, for me, that's, uh, that's been a great, a great experience. So I think um, we've got a few moments where we could uh, take, take some questions. What I'd like to do is, is if there's time, yesterday I was able to take some questions from the, the kids. Um, so today is, is your opportunity. <laughs> to ask a few questions. Uh, yeah, John, what's, are we going to have time for that or do we need to? Yeah, so they, the, the, the comment was that um, there was uh, an astronaut, actually, uh, John, he's been back for two years now. Yeah, it's been a while since uh, there was a, uh, we had an astronaut that we, we had on board the space station for not quite a year. Normal missions are about six months. Uh, this astronaut was up there for, for almost a year, and he has a twin brother. And his twin brother was a former astronaut, was no longer current, and so they did experiments on the two of them where they were collecting some of the same data on the two of them in terms of their blood and their and their DNA and things of that nature um, so that they could compare and, and try and understand the impacts of living in microgravity. 
And so through that process, they discovered uh, that there was some impacts on, on his genes, on his DNA, to where there were uh, some slight differences between he and his brother now. I, unfortunately, I don't, I don't uh, understand the details. I have not really seen the, the full reports on that. Uh, but essentially, that's what happened. And that's um, why is that important? Why do we, why do we even want to know that? Uh, because we want to go to Mars. We want to put a human on Mars. Now that mission is going to be six to nine months to get to Mars. You're going to be on Mars for probably a year. And then it's going to be six to nine months to come home. And so we need to understand what happens to the, the human body in that environment before we put someone out there where there's no way to get them back if something should go wrong if something should go wrong internally with their DNA, with their genes. And so that's why that uh, experiment was, is so important. The problem with it, though, is there's not a lot of astronauts. And they are a unique set of twins. And so the sample size is, is very small. So we always have to be very careful about jumping to too many conclusions based on just a, a couple of astronauts' uh, data. Yes, Sister Joseph. So the question is, it's fascinating to go to Mars, and, and why, but why does NASA say we need to, why do we want to go to Mars? Um, well, quite frankly, we're talking about DNA. I think it's part of our DNA. I think it's part of the human uh, psyche is that we are explorers, and, and we, um, there's something that just draws, draws us to explore, and I, th I think that's important. Now, that's at one level. I also think and I believe that as we explore the solar system, we learn more about Earth and, and our planet and how to keep our planet um, pristine and protected. And, and so part of going to Mars is going to try and help understand that, right? Because way, way, way in the past, Mars potentially had water and life and all of that kind of stuff. And if we can understand what happened there, maybe that will help us uh, uh, potentially avoid uh, something like that that happening here on Earth. So I think that's a, another reason why we explore. I'm, I also think that um, it's good to have other options out there, right? So that if we can uh, expand the human presence out in the solar system, um, again, if, if uh, things go bad here, that, that uh, we, still have, we still have options out there. So there's a lot of reasons why we're doing it. Uh, again, I think uh, it's part of our DNA, though, and that's uh, something that we're... We want to just keep doing yes, ma'am. Uh, is it true that the cover, U.S. government or NASA is keeping secret about uh, UFOs? Okay. <laughs> so the question was, is it true that the U.S. government is keeping secrets about UFOs? <laughs> this is being taped, right? <laughs> um, not that I'm aware of. How about that? You know, I oftentimes get, get asked about that and uh, of whether, you know, I saw UF, uh, UFOs or whether I saw aliens. Uh, I mean, it's kind of interesting, right? We're here at a, at, a, at a Eucharistic convention and, you know, you get asked, do you believe that there's other life out there? And, and quite frankly, um, if that's God's will and he put life out there, then he put life out there. That's uh, beyond... That is beyond my ability to grasp, ability to understand, and, and that's where I have to fall back on my faith and, and believe that the, if, if there is life out there, uh, then it's meant to be out there, and uh, it was due to God. So, thanks. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I'll get to you right after this one. We have a time system on Earth. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is the, that's a great question. Um, he, the question was, if you go to Mars, you know, here we have our 24-hour day and, and hours and minutes and all of that, and, and that's how we uh, keep track of how old we are and, and things of that nature. So if you go to Mars, what, what do you do? How do you keep track? Are you uh, uh, one day old, uh, you know, does, do you count, count the 24 hours? Do you not? Um, I don't know the answer to that. That's, it's a great question. It's one of those things that we have to still figure out. What, how, what, what time are we going to keep the astronauts on? 
So for example, on board the International Space Station, we stay on GMT time, Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, so that's basically over England, uh, about the time that they're on. And, and so all of the mission control centers that are around the world, in Houston, in Moscow, in Munich, and in Japan, they all operate on GMT time on board the station. And so what that means is, uh, so when we get up on the station at uh, 5 in the morning, 6 in the morning, we start our, our uh, daily conference with the ground at 7 in the morning. Well, it's midnight, 1 in the morning in Houston. And so there's a lot of shift work for our ground teams uh, as we go around that. So now you bring up the great point, what are we going to do when we're in Mars? And uh, unfortunately, I, I have to say I don't know the answer, answer to that. Um, first, we've got to get a big rocket that's going to get us there. And, and then after that, once we have that, maybe we'll start to figure out some of those, those little details. Yes, ma'am. When I, yeah. Yeah, so the question is, how did I feel coming back to Earth? Did I, did I look at things differently? Um, you know, you, you think about God looking down at the Earth, and, and did my perspective on it uh, change? And the answer is absolutely. It, it does change. Um, it gives you an appreciation for what we have here on Earth. It gives you an appreciation for how fragile this Earth is and how important it is for us to, to protect it and uh, be good stewards of, uh, of Earth. Um, and, and so, yes, your, your perspective does change. And I'll also say what was interesting for me is... Uh, you know, we do a lot of PRs when we're in space as well, where we get to talk to, um, you know, reporters and school children and things of that nature. And I got asked a question by a kid once that said, uh, if you could go anywhere in the universe, where would you go? And for me, the answer was simple. I told him I'd come right back to Earth. Uh, there, is, uh, there is nothing better than, than Earth. And one of the interesting things for me, uh, a lot of things you don't realize you miss until you, until you leave and you aren't able to experience those. You know, we talk about uh, the heart grows fonder with distance sometimes, and, and in my case that was certainly true. And the example I'll give you is, and this one I didn't realize until I got back to Earth. First weekend I'm back on Earth, so I've been gone up in space 166 days, and I am standing in my backyard, and it's raining. And I am just looking up with the rain falling down on my face, and I realized how much I had missed weather. On board the International Space Station, it is always, I'm sorry, I don't have the conversion, it's always 72 degrees. There's no wind, there's no rain, there's no snow. It never changes. And so when you get back and you realize, wow, I miss weather. That is part of being alive. That is part of the human experience. And when you, when you have that pulled away from you, you miss it. And so I told myself when I got back, I am never complaining about the weather again. <laughs> and I got to tell you, this past uh, August, when we had Harvey roll through Houston, that was challenging. Um, but, uh, but I still am and committed to that. I will not complain about the weather again, because it is, uh, it is great to have those kind of changes and, and experiences down here on Earth. Yes, ma'am. I'll come back to you next, sir. So the question was, did my colleagues know what was in the pics? And the answer to that is yes. Um, so NASA, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, you know, they don't promote a, an individual religion or anything of that nature, but at the same time, they don't prevent you from practicing your religion and, and your faith. And the same goes with your crewmates. Right? So they were certainly aware that I had the, the pics, particularly Oleg and Sergei, because I was launching with them in the Soyuz, and again, as I mentioned earlier, everything that you're taking up with you is categorized, and, and so I certainly made, Oleg was the commander of the Soyuz, and so it was very important that he understood uh, what I was uh, taking with me, taking the body of Christ with me. So yes, they did understand that, but uh, again, uh, each individual astronaut practices faith in, in his own way, and uh, certainly NASA allows that to, to happen. I'm going to go to the... I would certainly, sorry, I'll take one from backstage here. Yes, sir. Still in touch with your fellow yeah, am I still in touch with my fellow astronauts? I certainly am. Uh, I am still an active astronaut, so that means, what that means is I am uh, assignable for, for another mission. Uh, currently, we are building two new 
spacecraft to take us to the International Space Station. And we're going to start launching those from uh, the, uh, the U.S. at the end of this year. Early next year, hopefully, we'll, we'll put crews on board those. Um, I have an opportunity, and it is only an opportunity, to potentially be one of, one of those that gets to launch uh, on one of those early missions with these new vehicles. And, uh, and, and so, um, you know, God willing, uh, if I do have that, you can, you can uh, be rest assured that I'll be requesting that uh, the Eucharist go with me again, the body of Christ go with me again. But anyway, I do keep track with my, my uh, colleagues that I was on board with. Um, it's kind of interesting, I was on board uh, during the time when the Ukraine crisis kicked off. And of course, I'm on board with three Russians. And what was interesting about that was we definitely saw that crisis in, in uh, different ways uh, between the U.S. astronauts and the cosmonauts. Uh, but the amazing part about it was uh, it had absolutely no impact on our personal one-on-one -on -one relationships. It had no impact at the end of the day because we relied on each other to keep us safe and to get back to our families. And so it, it is amazing when, when you're in that kind of environment how all of the geopolitical going back and forth just takes a back seat. And so I think uh, one of the great things about the International Space Station is that it is an example of what cooperation uh, between nations can really get you. And, and so hopefully that uh, will serve as an example that, that uh, will, will help make things uh, better around the world. Uh, I've had a question all the way in the back, so I'm going to come back to this gentleman right back here. I think I probably have just a couple more questions, and, and then we're probably going to have to wrap it up. Yes, sir. So the question is, what are the criteria if you had New Zealand, uh, young New Zealanders that wanted to, to join NASA to become an astronaut? Um, unfortunately, right now, um, right now in terms of being a NASA astronaut, you have to be a U.S. citizen. And, uh, and the same goes for the Japanese astronauts, same goes for the Russian cosmonauts, the same goes for the European astronauts, you have to be from one of the countries that are part of the European Space Agency. Now, uh, what I'm going to say though is last year I had an opportunity to participate in our selection process. We just brought in a new, a new group of astronauts in August. There were 12 new astronauts. We started out with 18,000 applications. Um, so it was quite a process to get uh, down to that selection. But one of the things that amazed me was there were several, so, so what we do is we, we, we review all of those applications and we, we got it down to 120 and we brought those 120 in for interviews. And in those uh, candidates that we interviewed, there were several from other countries that had immigrated to the U.S., um, had become U.S. citizens. Some of them were dual citizenships and we actually had an opportunity to uh, apply in, in other countries as well. But I was, one of the things that amazed me was the, some, of those, some of those candidates that had come from other countries, um, they mentioned the fact that when they were growing up, when they were young kids, they had no idea that they could even dream about being an astronaut. And that really struck me as strange because you know, I grew up on a farm in Missouri, rural community, went to a high school with only 200 people, and, and so, you know, quite frankly, the, out of my class of 70, maybe 10 of us went to college. You know, the majority of us, would, majority of us stuck around where we grew up and, and worked in that community. But despite the fact that we didn't grow up with a lot, and I never felt like I couldn't become whatever I wanted to try and become. I never felt like any doors were closed to me. And so it was very interesting to me to hear, uh, to hear some of those candidates talk about like and talk like that. And so actually when I went to visit the Westlake Girls School on Friday, um, that's what I started with, was describing that because I wanted to try and emphasize to, to those uh, uh, young ladies that, you know, if you can dream it, there's probably a way that it can be achieved. And, and so to encourage them to to pursue um, careers in STEM if that's what interested them because you never know what's going to happen. When I talked about these two new vehicles that we're building to go to the International Space Station, well these are being built by commercial companies. 
And so, you know, NASA is kind of going out and leasing these vehicles to get us to the International Space Station. Why is that a good thing? Because I believe that eventually that is going to help open the door to space to more and more people. You know, we're talking about being able to uh, turn over the space station to uh, commercial ventures in the future. And if that happens, uh, well then maybe it's not a NASA astronaut that just gets to go. Maybe it's a kid from New Zealand that gets to go up there and, and uh, conduct experiments and, and things of that nature. So I would certainly encourage them to, uh, uh, to study in the, the science and technology, engineering, math fields. And uh, certainly the other th important thing is to do something you're very passionate about and, and then hopefully uh, uh, if, if the cards are right, they'll have an opportunity to, to maybe go up someday. Yes, ma'am. So the, the question is, what's the language on board the International Space Station? It's uh, two official languages. We have both Russian and English. So when I first came to, uh, to NASA in 2009, I had to learn Russian. And uh, some of us are better at languages than others. Uh, but I got through it. Uh, fortunately, Oleg and Sergey that I, that I launched with spoke excellent English. So that was very helpful as well. But yeah, we do, we do speak both those languages on board. Yes, ma'am. So the question was, did I ever experience any conflict between science and faith while I was on board? And uh, my answer to that is no. Um, you know, quite frankly for me, uh, science is a part of God's work. And, and so I don't, I don't have a, a problem with it. I, um, I certainly don't think science answers everything. And, and so I think uh, there are always those things that, uh, that are hard to explain. And, and certainly faith for me uh, is, is an important part of, of the science as well. So personally, no, I did not have any issues with, uh, with the science that we're doing as well as, as my faith. Let's go with just uh, one more question and then I'll uh, just with a real quick closing. I've got one more slide I want to show you. Um, how about all the way in the back there? Yes, ma'am. In the red shirt, yeah. Yeah, so the question was, um, is my belief, did I increase my belief from having the opportunity to look down at the earth up in, from, from the heavens? And, uh, I, you know, that's a very difficult one for me to, to answer. Uh, Sister Alba heard me try and answer that yesterday as, as well, and I don't think I did a very good job of it. Uh, quite frankly, that's, that's a little bit challenging uh, for me. Um, I believe my, my faith is stronger, yes. Uh, I believe that I am still on a, a very long journey with my faith. Um, and, and one of the things I will say, um, when I think sometimes, at least for me, when, when we're in stressful situations, we sometimes tend to reach out to God through prayer and all of that more often than maybe when, when everything is going well. And I'm, I'm not making excuses or saying that's the right thing, but I think that is often, oftentimes the case for many of us. And, and so when I was on board the International Space Station, uh, as you can imagine, that sometimes can be a stressful environment. And I would say I, I definitely reached out to, to God um, a little bit more up there. I should probably be doing more of it down here as well. But uh, um, one of the other things that I had to constantly remind myself, and I think this was in the, in the brochure, uh, which maybe is a good thing to close with. But I had to constantly remind myself, Mike, you do not need to worry while I'm up there. You do not need to be afraid. When I'm going out the hatch on that spacewalk, if my faith is strong, if I believe in Jesus, then everything is going to be all right no matter what happens. And, and that really struck home to me uh, from being in space. So thank you for that question. Uh, if we could go to the, the one more slide here. Uh, so, that is uh, the pics in the, uh, in the cupola, so it's looking down at the earth. Um, this, uh, I did not feel right taking a picture of the pics when uh, the body of Jesus, when Jesus was still inside of it. So this picture was taken on my very last day in space after I received my, uh, my last communion in space.
And so it's uh, empty at this point, but I did want to uh, um, you know, remember uh, being able to take the picks up into space. And, and so that is, again, one of the last things I, I did while I was on board the International Space Station. Uh, so that is my journey. Uh, again, it's, it's one that's only just begun. And I want to thank you for, for listening and letting me share that with you. Uh, thank you very much.